Good morning. Welcome to Gloria Day on this fifth Sunday in the season of Lent. We are glad you are here as we gather together to worship our God. A couple of announcements before we begin our worship together. We have a new sign-up uh, process for helping out with worship on Sunday mornings, reading scriptures, uh, saying the prayers, leading in prayers, and doing the dismissal. That can be found uh, as links on our e-news or on our webpage. And so I encourage you to go to those places and sign up and help out and be a part of worship in those ways. We also have a survey for reopening that the Safe Start Task Force has put out. It's uh, very brief and uh, won't take much time at all, but if you can click on that link, either in the e-news or on the webpage, it will greatly help us to see where folks are at as we start to make those decision, decisions um, responsibly as we move forward to opening back up again. And then a couple of um, announcements that uh, are on a sadder note. We have had a couple of deaths in our community of faith over this past couple of weeks. The death of longtime member Rob Barton and the death of Barbara Lester. And so we keep their families in our thoughts and prayers during this time of grief and transition. And lastly, if you have uh, listened to or been watching the news, you have probably seen that there has been an increase in violence in our Asian communities. And so I want to start us with a word of prayer this day uh, for uh, healing in that area of our communal life together. Let us pray. O oh God, call us into a deeper relationship to be your church for the sake of the world. Help us to see with new eyes the injustices within the church and society. Call us to have a loving heart that respects and uplifts the humanity and dignity of every person. Open our ears to listen to and learn from the experiences of people of color. Open our mouths to speak up and about injustices. Join us with others to work for racial equality and inclusion for all people. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. Let us now begin our worship together with a brief order of confession and forgiveness. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit that we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Let us now confess our sin in the presence of God and one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. And so now in mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was indeed given to die for us, and for his sake God forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the church, of Jesus Christ, and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins. In the name of the Father, 
Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all.
Let us pray. O God, with steadfast love, you draw us to yourself, and in mercy you receive our prayers. Strengthen us to bring forth the fruits of the Spirit, that through life and death we may live in your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Hi, it's so nice to see you. Have you ever noticed that in the Bible, there are people who forget about God? And whenever that happens, and it seemed to happen frequently, God would send someone to remind them about God's love and that they are God's people. Over hundreds and thousands of years, God would send all kinds and all ages of people to help God's people remember. One of those helpers that God sent is Jeremiah. Jeremiah was a prophet, and prophets were people whom God would speak through to share God's word with the people. And God spoke through Jeremiah saying, hey, I want to try something new. I had sent a rainbow. I put rainbows in the sky to remind me and all people that I love you, that God loves you. But rainbows are way up high in the sky. And then God gave the people of Israel, God's people, the Ten Commandments on stone tablets that they could take with them, that God would go with them and rem they would remember that God was present with them. That was getting closer. But now God is saying, I want to be so close. It's like, I want to write on your heart how much I love you. Now, God is not saying, okay, I'm going to pick your favorite marker color and cut a little hole and then write, I love you. You are mine forever on the inside of your heart. In your heart are, means our Bible words that mean your whole you who you truly are deep, deep down inside of you. God wants to be so close to every part of you that whatever you're doing, you are remembering God. Well, Jeremiah also points us to Jesus because God wanted to be even closer and wanted to, us to get to know God in a new way. And God said, if I send my son, then people can get to know me through my son. So this is not baby Jesus. This is baby Adelie. She is very sweet. We'll see if she stays sweet. But look at babies. Yeah, look at babies. They aren't scary. They aren't gonna hurt anybody. They aren't a threat. They might fuss and complain and say, Oh, I'm hungry, or I need a fresh diaper, or I'm tired. Are you going to give them grins? Yeah. Babies like to be held, held close and loved. Jesus was a little baby and did all the little baby things like you and me. And then Jesus grew, and Jesus did chores and helped his family. And Jesus went to school and studied scripture and learned God's word. And then... Jesus shared God's word with other people and shows us how to share God's love with other people. Jesus fed people. Jesus spoke up if something wasn't right. Jesus took time for Sabbath rest and to be with God. And Jesus had a healing touch and was caring for people. And Jesus died on the cross for us because Jesus loves us, even though we mess up. Jesus loves us. We take time each Lent to remember Jesus on the cross. It's a hard thing to remember, but we take time for each Lent. That's Smokey, the kitty, and Smokey wanted to remember too. But we take time each Lent to remember Jesus on the cross so that we don't forget. Every Sunday, we're invited to worship so we don't forget how much Jesus loves us. And 
We also have opportunities for Bible study, for Sunday school, for quiet, for choir, also so we don't forget. It's important for us to remember that we are loved by God, even, even though we mess up. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you so much for loving us. Thank you for never forgetting us and help us to remember you and help us to be your helpers like Jeremiah and all of these other people throughout the centuries to um, help other people get to know you and to love you and remember you always. Amen. Can you say bye? Say bye-bye. The first reading this morning is from Jeremiah uh, chapter 31. Uh, it's God's message to the people of Israel as he readies them to bring, out, uh, bring them out of captivity in Babylon and return them to Israel. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. A covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is a covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, Lord, I will put my law in with them and write on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. Here ends the reading. The psalm for today is Psalm number 51, verses 1 through 12. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. In your great compassion, blot out my offenses. Wash me through and through from my wickedness and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my offenses, and my sin is ever before me. Against you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are justified when you speak and write in your judgment. Indeed, I was born steeped in wickedness, a sinner from my mother's womb. Indeed, you delight in truth deep within me and would have me know wisdom deep within. Remove my sins with hyssop and create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain me with your bountiful spirit. Second reading is from Hebrews chapter 5, verses 5 through 10. Christ did not glorify himself in becoming a high priest, but was appointed by the one who said to him, You are my son, today I have begotten you, as he says also in another place. You are a priest forever, according to the order of Machelzdek. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his relevant submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And having been made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. Having been designated by God a high priest according to the order of Machelzdek, 
Here ends the reading. The Holy Gospel according to John, the 12th chapter, verses 20 through 33. Now among those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks. They came to Philip, who was from Bethesda in Galilee, and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life will lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor. Now my soul is troubled. And what should I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it is for this reason that I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it and will glorify it again. Now the crowd standing there heard it and said that it was thunder. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. But Jesus answered, this voice has come for your sake, not for mine. And now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to indicate the kind of death that he was to die. Here ends the reading. Well, grace to you and peace from God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Again, welcome on this fifth Sunday in the season of Lent. Next Sunday is Palm Sunday already. And we invite you to send in your pictures, if you have not already done so, of waving a palm or uh, even just waving the palm of your hand. We want to have a procession of pictures of people of Gloria Day for that day, for that Sunday. And today's gospel brings us one step closer to the end of Jesus' earthly ministry here as one of us. He has traveled all over the region. Jesus has preached and taught and healed for three years, both in Jewish and in Gentile territories. He's covered a lot of ground. He's welcomed and touched and healed and forgiven children and women and Samaritans and Romans and sinners, tax collectors, lepers, prostitutes, corrupt politicians, those who are outcast and on the fringe of society. That's what the, the, the last three years of Jesus' ministry has consisted of. And now here on this fifth Sunday in Lent, as we near Holy Week, Jesus is coming to the end of this earthly journey in the flesh. As Christians, as followers of Christ, we hold dear to the reality that Jesus sacrificed himself to save the world. And we often look at his death on the cross as that sacrifice, but the reality is, is that the ultimate sacrifice Jesus made for you and for me was the moment Jesus said yes. 
The moment Jesus said yes to become God incarnate, God Emmanuel, God with us, is the ultimate sacrifice that Jesus gave to you and to me and to all of humanity. Luther once mused it would be like you or I agreeing to become a slug to help slugs. Think about that for a moment. The sacrifice that God and Jesus Christ gave to us in becoming one of us. Back at the beginning of Lent on Ash Wednesday, we remembered our humanness, our mortality, by smearing the ashes and the dust on our foreheads, remembering that we are dust and to dust we, will sh we shall return. Jesus came to live that reality with you and with me and for all of creation. That is the ultimate sacrifice. For God so loved the world, right, that the world was saved through God's only Son. John 3.16. And of course, I always have to continue with John 3.17 because I don't think one of those verses can live without the other. Indeed, God did not send God's Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Now, the reason I think it's so important for us to focus not just on the reality of the cross, that ultimate sacrifice that Jesus gives to us, is because indeed that was a great sacrifice. It's the sacrifice that ultimately brings us to salvation, but there's a whole lifetime of sacrifice that is also part of God's salvation, part of God's saving plan for the world. From the moment Jesus is born into our life, it is a sacrifice. And we should never forget that reality. For focusing only on the cross is like just reading the last chapter of a book, right? Sure, it may be the most important chapter, the final act where everything comes together and falls into place. But it's not the whole story. It's not the entire book. It's cheap grace. Over the past couple of weeks, I have had three funeral services that I have presided over. And it always seems strange to say, but it's really an honor and a privilege as a pastor to walk with a family in that transition as their loved one has gone from this life and into the next. Part of that process is talking with family and friends about the one who has died. And inevitably, I learned something new about that person, about who they were, about lives they touched, about who God called them to be. You see, that person those people, in fact, none of us, are just the events or things that bring us to the end of our lives. And so it is with Jesus. Jesus' death on the cross was indeed the last great sacrifice of his earthly ministry. That last great lesson where we learn indeed that death does not have the final word 
For even while we were torturing and humiliating and killing Jesus, God and Jesus still loves us and cares for us and forgives us. And so we must ask ourselves the the good Lutheran question. So what does this mean? What does this mean for you and for me as followers of Christ? What does it mean that Jesus' sacrifice was not just the sacrifice on the cross? It certainly was that but the sacrifice of Jesus' entire life to lead us, to teach us, to heal us, to feed us, to show us the way, a better way in a life of Christ. Well, good people, I believe it means that there is a a sequel to the story. I think that's what Jesus is really talking about in the, metaphor, in the metaphor of the seed today. Unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single seed. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. You see, good people, Jesus is the seed, and we, you and I, are that good fruit. Or to put it another way, using the the book metaphor, we are the sequel to the gospel story. Now I hate to say it, but sequels usually are never as good as the original story, right? And so far, perhaps that seems to be true as you look out into our troubled world today. But we are now the body of Christ here on this earth, called to live out the gospel story in our own lives and in our world here now today. Sometimes we do good. Sometimes we fall short. But we are called into that gospel story. The good news of this gospel story is that it's still being written. And God is the author and Christ is the editor and we have indeed creative license for good or for ill to be our own character in this love story. And that, good people, I think is why it is so important for us to see not just the cross but the life of Jesus that brings light and life into the world. It is important for us to see it and to follow it as followers of Christ. In this season of Lent, In our world today, I encourage you to read and be inspired by the Gospels. Study Jesus' life. How did Jesus live and act and respond, especially to those in need? And then look. Really look at our world today. As Pastor Phil talked about in his sermon last week so eloquently, look into the face of the trouble in our world. Look and see what you see. Those in need, the homeless, the hungry, those being persecuted, those of Asian descent or people of color or Native American folks those who are refugees, those in other parts of the world, and those perhaps on our own border, those who are in need of healing, the addicted, those without adequate or proper health care. 
look at that world around us. And then ask yourself, what would Jesus do? Because we now are living that sequel of the gospel where we must ask ourselves, what can I do? Our Old Testament lesson tells us God has written God's law, God's word on our hearts. And our psalmist proclaims, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. So look at the realities of the world around us today and pray to God for a clean heart and ask yourself, what is my role? What can I do? How can I be God's presence and God's peace and God's light in this world? Unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground, it remains just a single grain, but if it dies, it bears much fruit. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor. And the good news of this gospel story and this gospel sequel to God's love story for creation is that the final chapter is already written. God already holds each and every one of us in God's loving arms. And to that we can say, thanks be to God. Amen.
Relying on the promises of our faithful God, we pray boldly for our church, our world, and all who struggle with great need. You cleanse us through and through and remember our sin no more. Make our church a community of forgiveness throughout our area. Give your people courage to forgive. Through us, show our neighbors new possibilities. Bless the ministries of repentance, reconciliation, and renewal. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Creator God, you fill our earth from tiny grains of wheat to the mighty thunder with your presence, and you call us to attend to your will for all creation. Grant weather that prepares the soil for seeds. Protect all from violent storms, flooding, and wildfires. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. You promise to write your law on our hearts. Guide citizens throughout the world to shape communities that reflect your mercy, justice, and peace, and give to all the urgency and creativity to work for the welfare of all. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. You sustain us with your bountiful spirit. Restore the joy of all who need to know your presence. For those who are lonely or feel unforgivable, those who need healing of mind or body, those who are in the valley of the shadow of death, and for all who grieve, we pray. Give healing and strength to all who call to you, especially those on our prayer list and those we name aloud or in our hearts. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. We pray for all those who grieve and suffer the loss of a loved one, friend, coworker, or neighbor, especially those impacted by the death of someone from COVID-19 and those who continue to struggle with the long haul effects of COVID. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Jesus calls us to follow him in life even unto death. Empower our congregation in discipleship. Equip children and teachers in Sunday school, confirmation, and learning ministries. Give us your truth and wisdom, and teach us to follow Jesus. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. In the cross of Christ, your name is glorified. We praise you for those who have given us words and music by which to worship. We pray for our lay leaders who respond to God's call to serve, who accept invitations to share their gifts and skills, to serve neighbors in need, nurture the faith of others, give of themselves to grow our church, and equip disciples of all ages. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. We entrust ourselves and all our prayers to you, O oh faithful God, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Please take a moment to share that peace with those around you. Say a prayer for peace or as we've been doing the last couple of Sundays, maybe take out your phone and text the word peace to someone who you know and love. Let's continue now with our offering and offertory music. And once again, thank you so much for the support of Gloria Day and all the many ministries we share together as a body of Christ.
Let us pray. Faithful God, you walk beside us in desert and in dark places, and you meet us in our hunger with bread provided for us from heaven. Accompany us now in this sacred meal that we may pass over from death to life. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, amen. And now as we gather around this table of grace, as you gather around your table at home or wherever you are, we remember that on the night of Jesus' betrayal, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, Jesus took the cup. When he had given thanks, he gave it for them all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. It is shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. And so even now as we receive his true body and blood, his true presence here in this bread and wine, let's remember the prayer Jesus taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. These are the gifts of God for you, the people of God. Everyone is welcome to the celebration feast.
And now may the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you for the journey ahead, both this day, now, and forever. Amen. God of steadfast love, at this bountiful table, you gather your people into one body for the sake of the world. Send us in the power of your spirit that our lives might bear witness to the love that has made us new in Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. And now may the good Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.